Hi, everybody. Ian Bremer here. Back to school, back to work. Uh, a quick take to kick off your week and the work year. Um, I want to talk about the Middle East uh, and uh, big demonstrations, the largest social dissent we have seen uh, since the October 7 terror attacks, since the war in Gaza has started in Israel. Um, and the proximate uh, reason for this was the Hamas execution of six uh, Israeli hostages uh, in Rafah, uh, likely before uh, those positions were uh, overrun uh, by Israeli uh, defense forces. Uh, the broader uh, point, uh, anger uh, with the way that Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, is uh, continuing to prosecute uh, the war. Um, and uh, it's a big deal. It's a general strike of the largest uh, labor union in Israel, just as everyone in Israel is coming back from vacation. Uh, and so uh, large scale action and certainly has an impact uh, on the economy. Uh, the uh, anger in particular with demanding a ceasefire deal and demanding the release of the hostages uh, who have been held now for almost a year. Um, this has not been seen to be an adequate priority by the of the prime minister by a majority of Israeli uh, citizens. This is not because there are large numbers of Israelis that are in favor of a two-state solution uh, for the Palestinians. That's not the case. It's certainly not the case that there's any sympathy uh, for Hamas. Uh, or uh, that the Israelis are angry that a lot of Palestinians have gotten killed. That is not the issue either. It is that they want an end of the fighting. Um, they want uh, the, the hostages back, and they want a deal done, um, and uh, they're, they're tired uh, of the way this war has been prosecuted, especially because... Um, the Israeli defense minister, the head, head of the Shin Bet, um, other senior military officials have broken themselves with the Israeli prime minister and said that they do not support um, what the Israeli leadership is pushing for um, on the ground in Gaza. Um, there are other fights about an Israeli budget. Uh, there's the longstanding fight uh, that uh, pre uh, that was before uh, October seventh on the independence of the Israeli judiciary. It's felt very strong um, in Israel. There's the question um, of, uh, of 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 enlistment uh, and the exceptions uh, for the Hasidim for the far right. Um, Israeli ultra-Orthodox, uh, all of these things in a very divided, very fragmented Israeli political system um, are creating plenty of folks that are angry with the prime minister, but he is still there and there is no way in the near term um, to take him out. Now, I don't think this labor union strike matters all that much. It was not on the basis of a labor dispute. It was a political action. And in that regard, the Israeli government um, took them to court. Um, the, uh, the courts ruled that they had to shut that action down. Um, the labor union um, agreed and shut it down. There's a lot of uh, Likud, uh, Netanyahu's party, uh, oriented political uh, leaders uh, among uh, the labor union's leadership. Um, and so it is unlikely, I think, that you're going to see a lot more of this uh, over uh, the coming weeks and months. But you could still see a lot more uh, social instability, a lot more unrest. And now that you've had hundreds of thousands on the streets, which had, had not been occurring while the war is on, you've kind of taken off um, this restriction on, well, as long as there's a war, we all need to be hanging together. We need to be supporting um, this Israeli war cabinet. The war cabinet's had resignations um, and uh, society is back to its fractious um, and very loud and boisterous self um, in Israel. Now, um, the Knesset is coming back in session, the Israeli uh, parliament in October. Um, and as that happens, there's going to be a lot more 
uh, fighting against uh, Netanyahu's position, and you could possibly see no confidence vote um, to bring down his government. Um, one of the reasons why we don't have a ceasefire um, is because uh, Netanyahu understands that the way he stays in power is by keeping his coalition intact with the far right, and they strongly oppose and have consistently strongly opposed um, any agreement uh, that would uh, allow for a uh, long-term ending of fighting on the ground in Gaza. They also want continued control, some level of Israeli occupation over Gaza. They don't want self-governance of the Palestinians there. And again, we're not talking about Hamas. We're talking about any Palestinian organization. Um, that uh, is... I mean, politically, you have to say that Netanyahu has done an extraordinary job in being able, a masterful job politically, in being able to maintain his position um, under such an extraordinary level of pressure and with such unpopularity among the Israeli population. Um, More broadly, there's the fact that the United States looks feckless on this issue. Um, Biden um, has now come out uh, and said that Netanyahu is not doing enough uh, for a ceasefire, and Netanyahu's response was extremely strong, um, saying, you know, publicly, both Biden and the Secretary of State and others um, have consistently and repeatedly said that the Israelis have accepted extremely generous terms for Hamas. It's Hamas that's refused, and now Biden's saying that they're not doing enough. What's changed? only that six hostages have been executed. And after that, you're putting more pressure on Bibi. Uh, You can imagine that that makes Biden look extremely weak. And the issue here is that Biden has not been willing to be critical of Netanyahu publicly. He's only put some, a little bit of pressure on the Israeli leadership privately. And that makes him look weak publicly uh, when Netanyahu makes those claims. All of the efforts to try to get a ceasefire by the United States are going nowhere, in part because Hamas refuses the terms, in part because the terms that the U.S. says Netanyahu accepts, he doesn't really accept um, when they are having private discussions. Um, And so the U.S. is trying to paper over a chasm between the two fighting sides Everybody else wants to paper that over too. I mean, you know, if you look at who wants a deal here, um, you would say the majority of the Israeli population, the Gulf states, the Egyptians, the Europeans, heck, the Chinese, um, and the United States, uh, but not Bibi's government and not Hamas. And that's why we continue to have this level of fighting. Um, That's also why we continue to have the Houthis attacking oil tankers, including a Saudi-flagged tanker, clearly by mistake, uh, in the last 24 hours um, in the Red Sea. Um, It's, you know, you've got American military, UK military, others in operation um, across the Gulf, and yet incapable of preventing this ragtag group uh, of militants from Yemen um, to uh, continue to disrupt global supply chain. You continue to have um, militants in the so-called Iranian-led axis of resistance um, attacking U.S. and other allied targets across uh, the region. And so it's very hard to see this war coming to an end. It's very hard um, to see Netanyahu leaving power um, in the near term. It's certainly hard to see any um, option for the Palestinians uh, that would de-radicalize them um, in the near future. Um, Kamala Harris has been doing her best to say very little on this issue because, of course, she is not in a good position to try to carry water for a policy that clearly has failed uh, for the Biden administration heretofore, and that's specifically to end the fighting, to get the hostages freed, to create at least a temporary but hopefully longer-term ceasefire, and to create a two-state solution. None of the things that the Biden administration has said that they want on the ground in the region are happening, and that means that Kamala has a lot of vulnerability 
um, on that policy. That's interesting because, you know, where she would clearly like to be would be in coordination with U.S. allies. And one of the reasons why U.S. policy on Ukraine has been much more successful in the Middle East is because it's been in lockstep with everyone in NATO. Uh, sometimes moving too slowly, but nonetheless, all these countries are agreeing on the sanctions, on the diplomatic efforts, on the military support for the Ukrainians, the training, the intelligence, all being done together. That's not true at all. You've got you know the new Labour government in the UK now saying that a number of weapons systems being provided to Israel um, would be uh, uh, in likely uh, used in the commission of war crimes uh, by the IDF. And so the UK government has said that those specific weapon systems will no longer be provided to Israel. Now, most weapon systems will still be provided by the UK. So it's not like the reality of UK policy and US policy towards Israel are all that different. This is a fig leaf by the Brits. But the point is, these countries are all freelancing. They're making policies by themselves that makes it much easier for the Israelis um, to focus on the United States um, and to also take the actions they want to. If you had a, a more coordinated policy by the United States and all of their allies on Israel, it would be a strong policy. It would be a policy that would protect those countries politically um, to a much greater degree. Um, that's not where the U.S. or NATO is right now. I do think that's something that Harris would want to accomplish if she were to become president come January, but we are still many months away from that possibility. So anyway, a lot going on right now in the Middle East, certainly not working out in America's favor um, and not working out in the Israelis or the Palestinians either. That's it for me, and I'll talk to you all real soon.